The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. One of the services IONS provides its members is a monthly report of a near-death experience or other spiritually transformative experience. These stories can prove to be transformational all around, not only for the experiencer, but for the listener as well. And for this reason, I like to read them from time to time to you. The following is one such monthly near-death experience provided as a service to members of IONS. And, of course, IONS is grateful to those who send accounts of their experiences and hopes listeners will continue to do the same. In this account from England, a young mother leaves her body and describes tumbling through a tunnel, watching a movie of her life, remembering times she was abused and times she frightened others, and merging with the light and receiving perfect love there, as well as knowledge of changes humans must make to heal themselves and the planet. She only agreed to return when she was shown her newborn daughter and her life if she didn't return. But her sacrifice of returning took its toll for many years, until after her father died seven years later and she learned to give the love she had received in the light. She uh, she formed an online community for those healing from abuse and addiction, and she wrote books to share what she had learned from others. And here's her description of her NDE. When I was 20, I went into early labor with my first baby. After four difficult days, I was given an episiotomy from which I lost a huge amount of blood. Two days after my daughter was born, it was decided that a blood transfusion would be started. Roughly two hours into the transfusion, I felt I needed to use the toilet and hauled myself up, dragging the bag of blood beside me. Never before or after this experience have I felt so weak and floaty. It was a great effort to move. I shuffled myself back from the toilet to the ward and slowly and carefully laid myself down. The ward was empty except for one other new mother who lay opposite me. I smiled at her and realized I was shivering. I have always felt cold, so at this time I assumed I just needed to warm up. I tried to lay still for a moment and quickly realized my whole body was shaking. The woman opposite me asked me if I was okay. I tried to tell her yes and that I was just cold, but my teeth had begun to chatter and my jaw felt too stiff to control. Instead, I nodded, still not at all understanding why I was trembling. I reached for my buzzer to ask a midwife for an extra blanket. As soon as she saw me, she pressed a button behind me and within a few seconds I was surrounded. The transfusion was immediately stopped. I saw the woman opposite me staring at me. I was acutely aware of how scared she looked and of the curtain being drawn around her. I wanted to ask what was happening, but I I could not soften my jaw to speak, and almost immediately an oxygen mask was placed on my face. I remember fighting for breath. I remember how hard my chest was thumping. My thoughts seemed scattered. My eyes somewhat or frantic, and when I noticed my fingernails turning blue, I very calmly internally thought to myself, oh, I'm dying. It was very matter-of-fact, with a hint of oops. I tried to keep myself calm internally. I was talking to myself in my mind, thinking of my family, trying to gain strength from thinking of them. I remember feeling frustrated, annoyed that they weren't there with me, that I couldn't tell them goodbye. I tried to keep my eyes open, but suddenly felt so very tired. My eyes were so heavy, so I let them rest, and then I was up. I briefly hovered over my newborn baby, hoped she'd remember me, and then I was traveling. It felt like I was shooting through a tunnel, but I couldn't see any sides to it. It was dark, but illuminated. I was not alone. I could sense a presence with me. I was tumbling forward, upward, at an unfathomable speed. It felt like the wind all throughout me, inside of me. I likened it at uh, that age to being on a roller coaster, that rushing feeling. It was wonderful. 
I felt so light, so free. Simultaneously, I experienced this fully, this fully and watched myself experience this with clear vision from a little distance. I can still see myself tumbling if I concentrate on the memory. This traveling went on for some time until I became aware that I was in a new place, like a room without walls, without a ceiling, without a floor. I had 360-degree vision and could see all around me. Again, there was darkness, but I did not feel afraid. I felt a presence and also felt completely complete trust in this company. A movie, for want of a better word, began to play. It was black and white and huge, as if I were staring at a giant screen that filled the whole of every which way I turned. The movie was my life, from birth to death, every minute of it, every event I had ever experienced. I watched it and relived it. It was at this point I realized time did no longer appear to me as it had in my body. It was as if I was uh, were projected into a moment or dragged through time, backwards before forwards, to re-feel. I, wit- I witnessed at this point the sexual abuse I had experienced and suppressed as a young child, as well as out-of-body experiences I had at this time and at night when I was lying in my bed. I could see myself flying out of body, and I remembered it was at this point I also saw and recalled a guide that had been with me throughout my growing. While watching, re-experiencing each moment, I found I was now able to experience each event through the emotions of all present at each time. I watched my own poor mistakes and learnt from every reliving. I watched myself as a child, bitten by a guinea pig and in shock, half launch it onto the sofa. I felt shame at this time because I felt the fear of the guinea pig. No one condemned me. I was asked only what I had learnt. I was comforted at this time, consoled and reassured. I had learnt so much. How big an impact my seemingly small actions had on a large scale. How my choices and behavior rippled through the lives of countless others. How the love I showed spread like wildfire. How the way I mistreated others deeply hurt and affected them. And also how that pain, fear, and confusion would then impact the lives of others too. In the time I spent in this reliving, I developed a deep gratitude for many things. The experience of life, for one. The people and the hearts that had touched my soul in beautiful ways and the fragility of being human. My newfound wisdom seemed satisfactory, and we were moving. Again, we traveled through the illuminated darkness until I saw a pinpoint of light in the distance. When I saw it, it was like a remembering I knew where I was headed, and I wanted to get there fast. I can't recall if I was moving myself towards it or if I was being drawn to it somehow, but it was a need, a desire within me. We moved faster and faster toward the beam of light. It grew in size, in my vision and intensity. I felt like I was flying. We burst into it, and it was indescribable. It was every incredible feeling that I will never be able to describe. It was immediate peace, absolute whole peace all throughout me. There was no pain. There was no fear. There was no shame. I felt completely accepted, totally whole and loved, loved beyond comprehension, loved in my entirety, loved with a love I have not felt here, loved with the purest love there can be. I felt I was home. I felt I knew this place, space, being. It was light. It it filled every space of my 360-degree vision. It had no form that I can recall, which for a long time left me with other questions, but it was beautiful and not binding in the slightest. It was as if I merged with the light. It absorbed me. I absorbed it. We became one completely. In these moments, I learned much about our existence as humans, about our planet and what we as a species need to do to resolve its problems, the healing that our planet and we as people need. I was communicating with the light as well as experience being within it and one with it. 
conversation began using telepathy, I assume, and I was asked if I would like to return. The absolute truth of my soul is that I felt completely insulted at this suggestion. I was horrified at the thought and felt myself loud within me respond, No. There was a pause, and I felt a little confused, wondering why this was being asked of me. Again, the same question repeated within me. Do you wish to go back again? Again, I said, no. There was another pause, and then I was shown the baby I had just birthed, lying in the crib beside my body. I was shown much from time to, from time to come, various outcomes that depended solely on whether or not I returned to my body. There would be countless lives that would be touched with this love if I returned, and many that would not know it if I did not. I remember taking what can only be described as a deep soul sigh, a knowing sigh, an understanding. Immediately after seeing this and holding the vision of my newborn daughter in my sight and her possible future if I stayed, I said yes. I asked for a moment more, and I was granted it. I soaked all the love I could into my entire being. It felt glorious. I felt pure and light and whole and loved and loved and loved. In this moment, I understood everything. Creation, purpose, love, physics, numbers, existence, I was completely at one with all of existence. And then I was shooting backwards, and it was cold and dark, and I was grieving the light before I even hit my body. It was another two days before I could hold my baby. I spent 48 hours lying naked as the day I was born, in and out of consciousness. I couldn't speak. I just lay there and cried quietly. I heard everywhere. I felt trapped, restricted, lonely. I missed the light, the love, immediately and immensely. It took my spirit longer to recover than my body, though that in itself was a long time. I was very depressed for many years and often dealt with suicidal thoughts because the desire to be home was so great. I was confused for the longest time. I was afraid. I found being in a body painful, restricting, and limiting. I am still greatly uncomfortable with it. However, I have learned to love and be grateful for my life and breath. I was at my father's bedside when he passed on, seven years after my NDE, when many pieces seemed to fit into place in my mind. I started meditating at this time and rapidly forced myself to recover. From the sexual abuse, the loss of my greatest friend, my father, and the excruciating loss of light. I remembered my purpose at this time. I started an online community called Bruised But Not Broken, and over the following six years built a community of over 700,000 individuals that had experienced sexual abuse, trauma, addiction, loss. Together we work to heal our wounds and strive to be the best version of ourselves we can be. Since this time, I have also published two books, one relevant to my sexual abuse and healing, the other relevant to my near-death experience and time spent with the light and my higher self. The titles of the books are um, A Sparrow Stirs Its Wings and the other Conversations with My Higher Self. My NDE was without doubt the most incredible and transformative experience of my life. I've never forgotten a single moment of it and doubt I ever will. It took me time, but I allowed it to transform me in the most beautiful of ways. And I try every day to live and love the way I was loved in those very sacred moments. And there ends the account of her near-death experience. Well, I wanted to start the program today with a with a typical near death experience story that reminds us that it's all about love. That and that story in particular fit perfectly. Uh, 
What's about love? Everything is about love. When Jesus taught us to pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it was love he was talking about. Not rules, not economics or class or racial distinctions, not one religion over another. It was all about love for God and for one another. Now, recently I've been getting an upsurge of complaints concerning occasional remarks I've made about the deteriorating state of politics in this country. And generally I ignore that sort of thing since the show is, after all, all about love. But as uh, racism and white supremacy and suppression of free speech and the corrosion of our government progresses, it gets harder and harder, for me at least, to ignore the face of hatred and evil that seems to be corrupting our democratic way of life. You know, we all want to be loved by the light. It's built into our very reason for being, and we hope it will be found acceptable. We hope that we will be found acceptable to God when the time of our death arrives. God loves, but I don't think unconditionally. At least that's not the way we've been told. Jesus taught us that he forgives us as we forgive those who trespass against us. In other words, we get forgiven as we forgive. Love and forgiveness are intrinsically a part of one another, that's for sure. And God will ultimately love us to the degree that we have learned to love. I think that's the other equation in the Lord's Prayer. We are here on earth to learn to love, to love the way we want to be loved by the light. And frankly, there's nothing complex about how we attain that love or accomplish that love, I guess. Jesus told us exactly how to do it and what the results of our loving or not loving will be. He alluded to it in the story of the Good Samaritan when a man asked by the asked uh, Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? The answer was everyone. Everyone is our neighbor. But Jesus uh, said it most clearly in his story of the final judgment when God separates the sheep from the goats. And this comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus told his disciples, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Before him all the nations will be gathered, and he will separate them, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will tell those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer them, Most certainly, I tell you, because you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he will say also to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't help you? Then he will answer them, saying, Most certainly I tell you, because you didn't do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous 
into eternal life. Distressing near-death experiences tell us there is the potential for punishment, even eternal punishment. In a reality where there is no time, eternal means eternal. NDEers are given a taste of what we may ultimately experience, but remember there are two judgments described in the Bible. The beam of judgment is the judgment of Jesus uh, as we go through a near-death experience or transition from one life to the next. It's a gentle life review. It's a correction. And that's the um, the judgment we feel in a life review in a, during an NDE. The second judgment comes at the end times. It's called the white throne judgment, described in Revelation, but most perfectly described in the sheep goat parable I just read you from the Gospel of Matthew. There are those who believe they are loved by God simply for having faith in him. But that is not what the sheep goat story tells us. NDE or Peter Panagor, whom I've interviewed on this show before, is very fond of saying, I don't have faith in God. I know God is for real. I know it's real. And if I know it, I don't need to have faith. What he's saying is you don't need faith when you know something for sure. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with the obligation to do loving deeds, good works, uh, like feeding the hungry, clothing and housing the poor and disabled, comforting the stranger, treating others the way we ourselves want to be treated by others and how we ultimately want to be treated by God. When the rich overcome their exploitation of the poor, when Christians overcome their fear of other religions, when whites overcome their racism, when men overcome their abuse of women, when men and women overcome their mistreatment of children, when Big Pharma overcomes its exploitation of addicts. Well, clearly, I could go on and on and on. And if we look at it that way as an insurmountable uh, big picture, then things never will change. But if we tackle it one day at a time, one person at a time, one relationship at a time, we can begin to bring more love into the world and improve our relationship with God as well. If Christians believe, as Jesus instructed, that the hungry man on the corner is Jesus, that the homeless kid on drugs is Jesus, that the old man in the nursing home is Jesus, and that our family for us, especially, is a holy family deserving of our love and care, then our responsibilities and our actions shall almost certainly right themselves. Now, politics, on the other hand, is usually more divisive than healing. We can debate endlessly over whether Social Security and Medicare are good mechanisms for helping the old and the sick, or Perhaps it's a socialist conspiracy against the profit motive. We can debate endlessly over the benefits and liabilities of globalism versus nationalism and whether immigration is a strength or weakness in the American dream. We can debate over whether Obama or Trump is the more representative face of America. But what we should all be able to agree upon in the political arena is that climate change is threatening the future of this Eden we call planet Earth. And so I'd like to conclude with a, with a, a few remarks on that subject where we should all be um, more in accord. A recent study commissioned in Australia tells us what we are doing to the Earth right now and therefore to our kids and their kids, our grandkids, and all the generations that managed to survive down the line. Here's how that that uh, Australian study was reported in USA Today. As this was written by Elizabeth Wise in the June 5th, 2019 issue of USA Today. Elizabeth writes, a, a chilling Australian policy paper outlining a doomsday scenario for humans as we if we do not if we don't start dealing with climate change suggests that by 2050, that's only 30 years from now. We could see irreversible damage to global climate systems resulting in a world of chaos where political panic is the norm 
and we are on a path facing the end of civilization. The worst thing about it, experts say, is that it's actually a fairly calm and rational look at just how bad things could get and how quickly if humans don't stop emitting greenhouse gases into the environment. The scenarios, quote, don't seem that far-fetched to me. I don't think there are anything, there's anything too crazy about them, unquote, said Adam Sobel, a professor of applied physics and mathematics at Columbia University in New York City, who studies atmospheric and climate uh, dynamics. The paper was written by an independent think tank in Australia called Breakthrough National Center for Climate Restoration. It offers a scenario for 2050 in a world where humans don't lower car, car, didn't lower carbon emissions enough to keep the global temperature from rising. Last year's United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report said the world's nations must quickly reduce fossil fuel use to keep the rise in global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. The transitions must start now and be well underway in the next 20 years. The Australian report imagines a world where this, where this didn't happen and global temperatures warmed by 3 degrees Celsius or even more. That's a rise of 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And while that may not seem like a lot, on a worldwide scale, it is expected to result in massive catastrophic shifts to the weather, agriculture, and even the uh, habitability of some areas. Three degrees Celsius by 2100 is a pretty middle-of-the-road estimate. It's not extreme, and it's totally believable uh, if serious action isn't taken, uh, Dr. Sobel said. The writers say their scenario offers a glimpse into a world of outright chaos on a path to the end of human civilization and modern society as we have known it, in which the challenges of global security are simply overwhelming and political panic becomes the norm. Their scenario follows this outline. In the years leading to 2050, policymakers fail to cut greenhouse gas emissions. The case for the global climate emergency mobilization necessary to keep temperatures from rising is politically, is politely, rather, politely ignored. Global greenhouse gas emissions peak in 2030 and begin to fall due to a drop in fossil fuel use, but damage has been done and warming reaches 3 degrees Celsius. By 2050, sea levels have risen 1.6 feet and are projected to increase by up to 10 feet by 2100. Globally, 55% of the population lives in areas subject to more than 20 days of lethal heat a year, beyond the human threshold of survivability. North America suffers from devastating weather extremes, including wildfires, heat waves, droughts, and flooding. China's summer monsoons fail, and water in Asia's great rivers are severely reduced for the loss of more than one-third of the Himalayan ice sheet. Within 30 years from today, ecosystems and coral reefs and the Amazon rainforest collapse, affecting fishing yields and rainfalls. Deadly heat conditions turn many areas unlivable, resulting in more than a billion people being displaced in West Africa, tropical South America, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Two billion people globally are affected by lack of water. Food production fails by uh, one-fifth, falls by one-fifth, as droughts, heat waves, flooding, and storms affect crops. Rising ocean levels make some of the world's most populous cities uninhabitable, including Mumbai, Jakarta, Canton, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Lagos, Bangkok, and Manila. Billions of people must be located. Well, that's where we'll be in 30 years if we don't bring love to bear uh, for each other and for our planet. If we don't change things, if we do, if we find it in our hearts to change our behavior, well, I think there might still be hope for us. If we learn anything from NDEs, let's learn this, that love for one another and love for the planet is a, is mandatory if we're going to continue um, on, on Earth. Well, listen, we are out of time for today. <clears throat> if listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our past shows, uh, 
Just go to our website at nteradio.org and hit the Past Shows button. And for information about IONS and the upcoming conference just outside of Philadelphia uh, on, on Labor Day weekend, um, just go to their website at iands.org. And be with us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.